Yes, now we can go. Uh, wow. Um, welcome. It's uh, very nice and a little bit scary to see you all here. And uh, I'm especially happy to see a lot of old friends and also a lot of people that are new here. Anyway, um, I, I'm going to talk about how to, to, to write code. And um, in particular, a question that's been bothering me for a while, and I know it has bothered a lot of other people, is what is good modern C++? Uh, we've done a lot to the language over the last um, five, ten years. And a lot of people have ideas about what, what it is to write good uh, C++. And lots of people ask about it. So this spring, I started a project uh, trying to, to make some guidelines for how to write this. And it turned out that other people were on to the same kind of idea. Um, so some of us are trying to provide a useful answer. And one of the things that is important here is that we would like for the like to help many people. There's more than five, more than four million C++ programmers, and if we come up with a solution that can be handled by 200 language experts, we've failed. So uh, this is um, this is an attempt to to be able to help a lot of people. And another way of seeing it, that we have a great language now. And it's, it's a modern language. It can do really nice things that we couldn't do 10, 20 years ago. Uh, C++ 11 is good. C++ 14 is better. Both are in widespread production use. These are not toy languages. And from what I see in the standards committee, uh, C++ 17 is even better. And um, there's the technical specifications like um, that like uh, file system and concepts and such that are rolling out. Things, things are happening. So I know from experience, from widespread experience, from industrial experience, that C++ 1, anything uh, is easier to write, easier to maintain, runs faster, and can express more um, than older C++ styles, and with less code. This is a fact. Well, it's also a fact that very few people do it. That is, um, maybe you know a thousand people that write such modern code. Maybe you know 10,000 people, but that's a very small, tiny fraction of the community. We have to do something better. People are writing um, C++ in, in really archaic and foreign styles. Also, you go on the web and you'll see every little so-and-so trying to be a language expert and discussing the subtleties of our value references or something like that, which doesn't actually matter in most code unless you are writing a high-performance uh, library for use of others. So they're all trying to be language uh, uh, lawyers and are getting lost in technical details. So basically, the idea is, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I hit myself in the head with a hammer. And the obvious answer is, so don't do it. And that's what we are trying to do. Um, there's a quote by me. I guess one shouldn't quote oneself, but it's a good quote. Uh, within C++, there's a smaller, simpler, safer language struggling to get out. I think I said that in 94, 92. It's a long time ago. It is even more true today than it was then. We can simplify the code. We can maintain efficiency. And we don't have to limit what we can say. These are important things. This is C++. It's not a slow, specialized language for a particular application. So um, let's get it out. Let's get it out now. Uh, a lot of people's solution to getting things better and simpler is to invent a new language. But that's not now. If you invent a really good new language now, large number of people will be able to use it in 10 years. If you succeed, the success rate for new languages, especially for general purpose programming languages, is very close to zero. So let's do it now. And I want to use those compilers. I mean, have you seen what the compilers can do with your code in terms of optimizing it? 
doesn't matter which compiler you're using for, for a modern compiler and uh, sort of standard hardware. It's amazing. I mean, I'm not sure I could have done it if I had 10 years, but they did. This has grown up for a long time. This doesn't just happen for a new language unless you can hijack the C++ uh, code generation phase, which is a fair game. So I'm going to look for coding guidelines, provide guidance to people who wants to write modern C++, whatever that means. And I know that just telling people what to do doesn't quite work, so you need support by tools and libraries. And again, we want generality, we want performance, we want simple code, and we want portability. I don't want to be tied down to a particular hardware, a particular operating system. Those are the games. So I, I, I think we can do it. And I think we can do it. I know that I can't do it alone. I know that, well, there might be a genius somewhere, but I think I know that no individual can do it. And uh, no single company can. It will be captured for what that company was uh, particularly interested in, and you couldn't trust it over time. People explained that to me a long time ago to ensure that I took part in the standardization. So please help. I'm going to say a little bit, a bit more about what help we would like and who we are and things like that. So the initial work uh, started, uh, there was a project out at Microsoft by Herb Sodder and friends. I started something at Morgan Stanley. Uh, CERN has, has joined in and contributed a fair bit. And there are things available. It's, 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 it's uh, there. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, I'll give you the uh, URLs towards the end. Um, there's uh, guidelines, a lot of them. Um, there's a little support library, which is some very simple classes that mostly map into uh, standard uh, library stuff. And if not, it maps straight into portable uh, C++. Portable meaning Microsoft, GCC, Clangs on Windows, Linux, and Macs. And Max, yeah. And there's an analysis tool that um, will be shipped by the guys at Microsoft that wrote it uh, next month. And we hope to have ports available uh, later, maybe uh, November, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, software projects uh, sometimes suffer a slight delay. But we are planning for it. It, it exists. Uh, so I'm not saying anything in this talk that's science fiction. And it's the MIT license, so it's as, as open, as free as you can get it. Um, and there's more talks about this. Um, I'm sort of going to explain what we are trying to do in fairly high-level terms with some um, examples. Herb Sutter is going to talk more about it. Uh, Gabby Dosreis are going to talk how it uh, ties into some of the work being done in the Standards Committee for writing better code. And uh, Neil McIntosh, who uh, wrote the tool that we're working with, uh, is talking about static analysis and, and some of the classes. This is all this week. Uh, now, there is a problem with coding rules, with guidelines, which is, have you ever seen one you really liked? They may be necessary, but it's like medicine. It doesn't taste good. So uh, we all hate coding rules usual caveats and thanks to the people who have made this less true in particular cases, but basically we don't like it. And one of the reasons is that coding guidelines tend to be written to prevent accident, to, to keep uh, novices that are not as smart as us from doing stupid things. So it's a long list of don't do this and don't do that. And, well, I don't like such lists, and I know most of you don't either. And it's, they're very, re, uh, very often written at the start of an organization where people is a little bit uncertain about what they want to do and they want to avoid problems. And rules tend to focus on low-level things. I mean, uh, do you use camel case or underscores? Uh, how many uh, spaces do you use to indent? This is all very interesting. It could even be essential for an organization, but it has nothing much to do with how you get quality software. Um, at the higher level. How do you actually recognize a good piece of code when it comes and you see it? Um, also, a lot of them are simply sets of restrictions. Uh, don't use overloading, don't use exceptions, don't use multiple inheritance, 
Um, don't use casts. Uh, all kinds of rules like that. Some are good, some are bad, some are good in some particular uh, environment, some are not. And really, there's a lot of bad advice out there. I mean, there are guidelines that tell you that you really should try and write Java. Well, if you want to write Java, I know how to do it. Uh, don't, don't, don't try and stop C++ programmers from writing uh, good C++. And C with classes, it was really cool in 86 or thereabout. That's a long time ago. A lot of you weren't born then. And uh, there are people who think that really the world came to an end in, uh, in, 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 in uh, sort of 78 when, the first, when KNR1 came out. And they might accept a few things they got from C++ like function prototypes or const. But basically, you really should write code the, the way you do it in C. Really dumb idea in my opinion, but we'll get to that. Uh, also, coding rules get outdated. I, I saw recently a recommendation to use a coding guideline, which was a really good guideline. It described how to write good code in about 1988. It hasn't been updated. That's a long time ago. Um, and so they become a drag. A lot of codes uh, are specialized for particular um, application areas, like I helped to write a set of guidelines for hard real-time software, flight controls. These are very nice guidelines for that. But then people try and use them in other areas. And you know, one of the guide rules uh, for flight is that you don't use new after you take off. And you never use delete. So maybe these are not the most appropriate guidelines elsewhere. Other guidelines have similar kind of biases and constraints, and people tend to forget them. And uh, a lot of them are, are very long-winded, and you, you really had to be a language uh, lawyer to understand them. I looked at the rules for how to use pointers in Mistra uh, C++. I mean, that was miserable. It, um, they, they, I couldn't understand all of those rules, and, and you can't follow them, really. And a lot of tools doesn't have very good, uh, a lot of guidelines don't have very good tools. Um, and they have platform dependencies, da 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 da, da and they don't produce guidance. I, I really like to emphasize that telling people what not to do is less helpful than telling them what to do. So let's, let's do some good gu guidelines. Comprehensive, browsable, for modern C++, for the moment, first of all, let's, uh, let's ignore uh, legacy code, let's ignore uh, old stuff, let's write the rules for what we would like our code to look like in five to ten years. And then we'll deal with how to do the transition, how to do it incompletely when we have to. Um, gradual uh, adoption is essential. Prescriptive, teachable. One of the things that holds C++ back is there's a, really a lot of bad teaching material out there. Some of it is very old, some of it is backward looking, some of it is trying to maximize the uh, appeal by uh, dumbing it down and uh, things like that. So a set of guidelines can also guide uh, teachers to how, how to teach it. Flexible, of course, because it's a huge community. I mean, we, we cover just about everything that's being done in computing. And of course, non-proprietary, we couldn't possibly do this uh, with, with, with limits. So let's see. There, there are some high-level rules and there are some low-level rules. The high-level rules are there to provide a conceptual framework for everything. They're sort of philosophical in nature. And they're very useful, like you have to express the ideas in code. Compilers don't read uh, comments. And you use ISO standard C++. Yes, there are reasons for using extensions and such, but we're not going to deal with that. That will be for, for, for uh, particular restrictions. And we want static type safety, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a philosophical framework here. The problem is that, again, compilers and even programmers don't really get philosophy. It means you have to transfer it into something that can be understood in detail, in context, in a piece of program, and, and used. So for that reason, there's a whole bunch of low-level rules that, that basically guides you through the, the mess of alternatives and features. And um, the lower-level rules, things like 
use a T-star to designate a single object, not an array, and prefer initialization to assignment uh, or in, in constructors. These are easily checkable. You can have a tool that tells you when you, when you violate it. Always initialize an object. Compilers these days do, but it's a good rule, and we can do even better with external tools if we have them. So basically, that sort of shows the way through the wilderness. And um, the tools provide feedback for programmers. It also helps unify style. I mean, I, but if I look a piece in a piece of code and I see a string, if I know it's a standard string, I know a lot. And it helps me. I don't have to go back and read the manual again. Uh, and so uh, getting a more unified store uh, set in uh, a more unified style uh, helps getting code written quickly, helps me read code, understand code. And one thing you should understand is that the rules are not meant to be minimal and orthogonal. Uh, textbook read, uh, writers and such spend a lot of time trying to make sure that it fits in the minimal amount of paper or something like that. This is not what we're up to. We're trying to have the most helpful, and we can have a large set, and basically the tools will tell you when you f f uh, fall over the edge. So the structure of the rule is, is simple and structured. Um, no naked new, for instance. It's a, uh, it's, it's a rule, and there's reference numbers. People love reference numbers. It also means that you can search for them. Uh, it means that you can refer to them in error messages, things like that. Uh, and never, never tell people what not to do without giving a reason, or what to do without giving a reason. So every rule, the first thing that comes after the rule itself, is a rationale, a reason. Uh, and then comes an example, because we by and large don't understand abstract text. We need a concrete example or more. Um, if it's a don't do this rule, there should be an alternative. Never tell people what not to do unless you give them an alternative. Fairly simple to say. A little bit hard to do sometimes. These rules um, are, are evolving and will evolve for a long time. There's references to other things. There's notes, things that we just felt um, was useful to say. And then there's supposed to be some long discussions at the end where you, you, you discuss a set of rules and set of reasons and such. Uh, it's a bit weak just now, but that's the idea. Sometimes you need more as an explanation than what fits on about these many lines that fit right on your screen when you look at them. So that's the discussion. So that's structure. The general um, idea is that people who have tried to subset the language has by and large failed. The things you really want to get rid of, like bad uses of pointers, bad interactions between uh, inheritance and arrays and things like that, um, if you just ban everything to get rid of the problems, you can't write decent code anymore. Yes, I want to write high-level code, but how do I do that? I do that by having libraries that allow me to write high-level code, and they're implemented using the low-level code, because otherwise you can't get the efficiency and the portability out of, of that. So the general idea is not just a subset. First, we provide a superset. We have ISO standard C++. We have parts of the standard uh, library that we recommend, and the rest you can use when you want to. And we have something called the Guideline Support Library, which is a small set, small as in less than two dozen little classes and, 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 and things, and, and really is very small, that is added. And that way we can say the messy, dangerous bits, don't use them. We have provided abstractions that are uh, elegant and efficient that allow you to, to not go there most of the time. Uh, for most people, all of the time. Once you build that superset of the language plus libraries, then you subset and you can get rid of a lot of the crud. Um, this, this is not a brand new idea. I wrote a paper about it sometime ten, more than 10 years ago. And um, so really what we want is not, not some neutered subset of C++, which is a lot of people who tried. We want C++ on steroids, on the other hand. So more of the good stuff. And so the rules rely on the libraries. You can use any standard library, of course, and, but the ones that rely on things like 
standard library classes like uh, vector and unique pointer and some guidelines things, array view. This is when you have a, be a beginning of a sequence and, and end and you work in that. Not null, you can say that, say a pointer uh, shouldn't be null. I'll get back to that. And so there's rules for using the, um, the GSL. Uh, never transfer ownership by a raw pointer. So the idea is if you see a T star, it points to an element. You're not supposed to delete it because it just points to the element. Somebody owns it. That's it. And uh, if you want to have something that cannot ever be null and you still want a pointer, you can use a not null of that pointer type. Now, there's rules that encourage you to use higher level abstractions, but these here I chose to show how you can deal with traditional old style code and improve it. Don't pass an array as a single pointer, I mentioned that. So basically, I was asked to, to guess what this could do. And I, I don't actually think that it can do less than say double your productivity. This, this, is, this is a big, big, big claim. But I, I think it can be done. Look at a good programmer working on a um, modern code base and look at the same programmer working at a 20-year-old code base or 10-year-old code base. Also, look at a, at a medium kind of programmer and see what it takes to become a great programmer. You need support, you need time. We can lower that time. So I think um, we can imitate experienced programmers through rule sets uh, that we, we try and enforce. And so we can eliminate huge classes of errors. And so simplification is important. If we can have simpler code, maintenance improves. Consistent style speeds up learning. And uh, basically guide people away from the deep dark corners that they love so much. I mean, people, so many programmers spend so much of their time looking out the most complicated code and the most complicated rules of the standard, and, and I'm shaking my head. I mean, this hurts. Why do you do it? Um, so, and emphasis on avoiding waste, and that can improve importance. And basically, my guess is that every large organization, community that's doing this, We'll, we'll need to have some special rules for what they're doing. So I'm talking about what I call the core guidelines, things that potentially help everybody. And I think most of you will want extensions and places, and some of you will want restrictions too because there's some of the recommended rules that uh, doesn't quite fit in your uh, world, or maybe it doesn't fit there for the next couple of years till you've evolved your code a bit. And, and don't compromise performance. Performance is a really important aspect. So I don't think I've gone mad. I think we're actually attacking what we know to be the common most serious sources of errors. And basically get rid of, of, of errors. I mean, no, 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 uh, no resource leaks, that's good. We know how to do that. Eliminate dangling pointers. Uh, that, that's supposed to be very hard. I'll show you how we do that. Eliminate out of range access. That cannot be done without a few uh, runtime checks. A few. If you just check everything, you're dead meat. But um, a few can be done, and we, we, we have some uh, suggestions about that. And tool support is essential. A lot of this, humans are not actually very good at. I mean, you look at a million lines of code, and your eyes glaze over and you check for a particular kind of, of error or mistake in a million lines of code, 100,000 lines of code, 10,000 lines of code, and you get very tired and your concentration wavers. We need tools. And the support library helps by simplifying the rules. And a lot of it has to do with reinforcing the type system. We, we can do better than we, we did in uh, 78 and uh, 85 and thereabouts. So let's look at the core the core rules. Um, basically, we have to start somewhere, so gradual adoption will be the, 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 the way most of us will go on. If we write some brand new code from scratch, not using anybody else's libraries, then you can probably follow all the rules today. That doesn't happen very often. So I see gradual adoption being necessary, and 
we'll fo I'll focus on the core rules. So no leaks, no dangling pointers, no type violations through pointers at all. Uh, we know how to avoid leaks. We, uh, we just root every object in a scope. RAII kind of stuff, standard containers. Um, new and deletes disappear into the abstractions. I mean, this is nice. When I see a delete in application code, I think there must be a bug somewhere. Why? Because if there's one delete, there probably should be more, and there probably may, there may even be too many. So basically, new deletes disappear into um, classes, and when you then see a new in application code, you think there must be a problem here, because if there's a new, there should be a delete somewhere, and if there's a delete somewhere, we know from experience we make mistakes. So we don't do that. But this leads us to, to what I think is the worst nightmare problem, um, dangling pointers. And they're so easy to get. Here we have a, a function f that you give a pointer, and it deletes. So you delete to that pointer. I mean, that may be right, it may be wrong. On my rule of thumb, it's, it's very suspect because it's the lead in application code. Here's G, makes an object, calls F, and then it uses uh, Q, which happens to be the pointing to the object that was deleted in F. This is how you scramble memory. The rules will make sure that you don't do this, and it will take care of some of the most subtle and difficult to find bugs. And we have to do this because if we don't, we can damage type safety. I say this object is an integer. You do this example and the object, my integer lies at the place where your object was and you scramble it. Uh, memory safety, of course, because we are not using memory as it's declared. And resource safety is compromised because you can destroy things uh, that, that are lying around there, do, do double deletes or no deletes. So we have to solve this problem to get um, type safety, to get uh, resource safety. And we're going to eliminate this by a combination of rules. And I mean eliminate, get rid of it, verifiably. And we distinguish owners from non-owners. I mean, if I have a pointer, am I supposed to delete it or not? I have to know. Assume raw pointers to be non-owners. We have many pointers in our programs, far too many. But let's assume they are all innocent. They just point to a, an object. They are not supposed to be ownership. And um, catch all attempt for a pointer to escape into a scope that uh, is outside the scope of what it points to. It's fairly simple. And anything that holds an owner is, is, is considered an owner. So all of this works uh, recursively. So basically, this is a simple rule. Uh, we have some pointers. They point to an object. Um, the, that object is held alive by an owner. This works recursively. The object happens to have an owner pointer inside it. Th that's what we have destructors uh, to constructors to construct, destructors to clean up. And what we really have to avoid is that pointer there uh, that has been passed below the object's owner in the stack. So when we delete the owner, the object is not there and people are still referring to it. This must never happen. So if we can assure that, we're a long, long way to eliminate uh, pointers. This is not a new rule. I mean, if you look at the standard, it says that you shouldn't do that because you get undefined behavior. The point is, how do we actually get there? So uh, here's that dangling pointer thing again. Um, first of all, the rules will catch the delete P. You had an innocent looking pointer, X star. That's not an owner. So the rules will, will tell you not to do that. Tools that enforce the rules will tell you that code is bad. You go back to the uh, G. It says, well, new of X obviously produces an owner. So assigning it to a, 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 just a plain old pointer is going to be wrong, because this could lead to a leak. The fact that it also, uh, if you do that, will lead you to uh, problems with exceptions is another matter. So basically, 
we'll never get down to the problem because you've already been trapped by the simple rules twice. Um, so uh, we, can, we can look at how we um, represent ownership. And basically, you can pass a, you, you can mark every uh, owning point as owner. For a long time, I was thinking that we needed a bit to do that, a sort of a dynamic model. We just took every pointer and marked it whether it was an owner or not. And I, I've had models like that before, like you put on and saying whether it's a const or not and things like that. The point is this is useless. It is very good for thinking about problems, but it is useless for actually doing it because, well, it costs time or space to have that extra bit. Uh, or time and space. It means that the code that uses such uh, smart pointers, fat pointers and such are no longer ABI compatible with the existing code. It runs slower than uh, ordinary C or C++. That's not acceptable. And we have to rewrite all our code for it. So um, the idea is that you just have a, a thing in the type system called an owner, owner that the uh, static analysis uh, tools can, uh, can, um, can, can use. And when I talk about pointers, I mean anything that can point to, to an object. So if we can handle it for pointers, we can handle it for everything. References, containers, smart pointers, and things like that. And so um, <clears throat> we are going to eliminate all dangling pointers. Yeah, that was that. Oh yeah, down at the bottom you can see the definition of owner. It's just an alias. We've marked it as an owner. Humans can read it, tools can read it, but your linker doesn't care. So everything is, is working uh, as before. So here's how we can use it. We can use an owner to uh, improve our implementations of higher level abstractions. We want to use higher level abstractions like uh, vector instead of array. And we just mark that in this particular case, one of the three pointers inside the implementation of vector is an owner and the other two aren't. There's the owner, keeps it alive, the other two just points into it. That's sort of the general use you'll see a lot. And only if we um, are dealing with pointers directly uh, do we use owner. So there's an F that takes an owner and let's try and call it. I call it with a, an owner that'll transfer ownership. I call it with a non-owner, that's bad. I delete one of the owners, that's, that's good. I delete something that's not an owner, that's bad. We can catch it. And this is just marking, and the, um, the static analysis tool will tell you when you did something that wasn't good. I mean, an owner has to either be transferred to somewhere else or deleted. The, the code will, will, will check whether you do it. That, that, that's it. And owner is a low-level mechanism. You don't want to fiddle around with that level all the time. But having owner allows you to do two things. It allows you to implement your, it provides support for the implementation of higher level abstractions. C++ is a language where you can design your own containers, you can design your own smart pointers, etc. Now you get a little bit of support in, in how to express this and not make so many mistakes when you do it. And furthermore, there's ABIs. If somebody really says they want an int star, uh, you don't have to give up all your checking uh, to be able to, to use that ABI. Um, so let's see, what else do we have to do? We can now handle ownership. Now we have to handle dangling. Uh, basically, um, yeah. Don't transfer a pointer to a local where it could be accessed by the caller. Yeah, okay, let's look at the example there. Um, I'm returning something. I either return a pointer to a local. Not a good idea, we all know that. Compilers have been able to catch it uh, more or less consistently for the last 20 years. Then I'm returning a pointer to something I just created on the free store. That's fine. At least it's sort of fine because it didn't mark it as an owner. But as far as dangling pointers, it's not going to dangle. And there's finally the uh, pointer that was given to me 
then ObviSD I can give it back because it came from my caller. And those are roughly the only three cases. If we can handle that, we can stop pointers from escaping down in the bottom of the stack and outlive their owner. So basically, catch it for all kinds of things, pointers, references, etc., and that's so fine. So here, uh, let's see. We need to classify uh, according to ownership to work here because look at that uh, function f there. It returns a vector of integers. And inside that vector of integers, we have put something that's an owner, something that's a pointer to a local, and something we got uh, from uh, our caller. This we can't handle the ownership of. I mean, you, you, it, it's just mixed. That's, that's bad code. It's, it's asking for trouble. And, and it'll be rejected for, for mixing it. Um, in code, we would have to um, try and deal with it. And we can't, because really ownership has become mixed. When we pass it out, all the information about who should delete what has gone. The only way of doing that is actually to have something like a big bit vector of, um, that tells you which should be deleted. And, or you can um, sort of hope, or you can have pointer, you, you can change it into, in, into uh, unique pointers to represent the ownership. But basically, don't mix ownership in, in containers because in current code, it, it doesn't work too well. And uh, in, in, in this code, it'll be caught. So there's, of course, many other ways of misusing pointers and such. Range errors, dereferencing null pointers. And uh, so I'm going to go a little bit about that, uh, further like that. And I'll notice there's a couple of um, principles here. Uh, some of the rules are amenable to static analysis. Some of them are amenable to sort of hygiene. You can look at it and give it as a guideline. And some of it really requires runtime checks. And we want to minimize runtime checks because we want to run fast. So here is one of the... Um, tools that we are providing. It's uh, similar to a proposal in the standards committee. Uh, this one here, though, do rewrite, where for some reason I don't understand at all, the array view being proposed in the standard is a read-only uh, structure. Uh, but anyway, here, we have a common style. We, we call with a pointer and a count. This is my least favorite kind of interface. Least favorite because it is so error-prone and least favorite because it is so common. So a lot of the errors there. So I assign nine to P of seven. Is that okay? We have no way of knowing. The information is not there. Um, and I can make a loop from I to N. Let's hope N really was the count. And let we hope that the count is right, that's fine. So instead we provide an abstraction, which is a review, a beginning, an account or an end. It's doesn't matter. Uh, there, we could check at runtime if we wanted to whether A of 7 is, is, is valid. And if we don't want the checks, we could have them only in the debug mode. And we can now write a range for loop that will, uh, will work. Notice that there's no end to get wrong, and the code has actually simplified, and it's become more checkable. We are lifting the abstraction just one little bit. And so we can look at some calls there. Uh, I uh, call it for A of 100. I have to say A and I have to say 100, even though I already told uh, the program that there was 100 element in A. And if, I, if my finger slips on the keyboard and I write 1,000, all kinds of bad things will happen. Um, if, if it's a variable, it gets more interesting. For an array view, um, well, you could just say it was an array view, or you can rely on a conversion of an array to an array view. F just sucks up that array, makes it into an array view, having the size deduced. And uh, if you are going to call it with a value, it's fairly easy to, to check. 
uh, against the array if the value is there. If not, you're on your own as, as often. So basically, this follows the idea of making sing, simple things simple. An array view is really roughly the same as a, a p comma n, but we can use it easier and we make fewer mistakes. Null pointers deal with it simply by, by, by saying what we mean. The problem is today we don't say what we mean. I have an f of a char star. Is it all right to call it with a null pointer? Where does it say so? In the documentation. Okay. Compiler doesn't uh, read com uh, documentation, and neither do I when I'm in a hurry. Not a good thing. When I'm implementing F, should I trust that my users follow the rules or not? Should I test? If I test, I test too much because, and that's waste resources. If I test too little, we crash. There's all kinds of uh, things about that. So one way of dealing with it is we use a non-null. Currently, that's a, a class that will, will, will test whether it's non-null, but a lot of that can be eliminated and it could be debug only. So if a null pointer is obviously an error, I told them that f took a not null. And a uh, little bit more subtle, uh, subtle here, where if you pass a variable that is a null pointer, that requires checking. But now when we write f, we um, don't need to, to, to do the checking. Okay, so it's a simple, small, small class. It makes the code more explicit. It attacks a particular, specific, well-known problem. There's many ways of attacking most problems. This is the one we chose for this. So basically, we go after bugs. We provide type and resource safety. And um, now we can go after other problems, logic errors, performance bugs, maintenance hazards. There are rules going there, but they're not as complete as the uh, things for e extending a type system. Um, one thing we noticed is that there's a lot of overuse of smart pointers. Um, I noticed a lot of shared pointers being used simply to return a value from a function. Um, so the use count goes from 0 to 1, then 1 to 2, then 2 to 0, and uh, 2 to 1, then to 0. And all we did was to get something transferred simply because people didn't trust um, ordinary pointers, and quite reasonably so because ordinary pointers uh, might dangle. Well, wait a minute. We just solved that problem. So we have to th rethink the way we're using smart pointers, shared pointers in particular, and my feeling is that they're overused. A lot of the protection in, in shared pointer when used in that way um, is just overhead, because once the bugs have gone, um, then you, you don't have to have that use count anymore, but it sits there forever counting whatever you call and pass a smart pointer. Now, with smart pointers, with dangling pointers eliminated uh, by tools, you don't need to do that. So I'm going to show a little bit about that. So here are the alternatives in, in the standard. We can take a T star, and that de doesn't deal with ownership, it's just a pointer. Just use the pointer. With the rules here, we know that F of, uh, F of T star will not delete T. The, the, the rules will stop that. Uh, it just points to something. If we want to transfer ownership, we can use unique pointer. If you really want to share ownership, uh, we can uh, use a shared pointer. But if we look at the uh, T star, it's, it's familiar and it's, it's very general. If I have a shared pointer, I can take the pointer out of it and give it to this F. I don't have to, to do anything fancy. Um, no dangling pointers, and, and basically think about pointers, uh, simply things that designate things, and, and it works. So here, here's an example. Uh, F, G, and uh, H has been written using the, the different kinds of pointers. And if I make an F shared, if, it make, if I make an X, uh, a shared pointer to X with make shared, then to call if I have to, to get the pointer, if I'm calling G, we have 
uh, the overhead of um, using pointers. And the age, I really had to modify because if I pass the um, ownership in, I have to pass it out again unless I want it to be destroyed uh, up in uh, age. So we can keep things simpler now. Simply use f of int star such as we always did. Um, one question I've had quite reasonably is could the rules be enforced by the compiler? Uh, some could, some can't. On the other hand, I would like to use these rules now. And I would use, like to use them for all the compilers. So um, yes, it would be nice if the compiler builders would, would, would use some of these rules. But please be careful. Don't have false positives. People hate false positives, and that destroys the whole system just because people start suppressing things and, and, and not worrying it. And furthermore, an external tool is not just useful across the uh, span of compilers. It, it also can tolerate a few uh, more false positives and it can handle uh, uh, changes um, more easily. Um, you can use a compiler enforced rule only if all the compilers you use enforce the rules. Having an external tool helps. So let's start with an external tool, and if the compiler writers get interesting, so interested, that so much the better. And um, the other things, why didn't we just use the, uh, the standard only? Uh, because the standard currently, as it stands, doesn't have all the rules we want for the, standard, uh, for the GSL, the guideline library. We want to use things now. And it's tiny. It's portable C++11. It doesn't depend on other libraries, freestanding. You don't have to include a whole ball of wax with things you don't need. And basically, it's similar to uh, though not identical to boost and experimental components, there's actually a good chance that they will become standard in some form or other. But we're not going to wait. This is too simple, uh, too easy, let's get going. It's on GitHub, uh, some of you accessed it uh, yesterday and the day before. Um, and we use the standard library. Now, one of the things that you find with every sort of reasonably comprehensive and reasonably good um, rule set is there's too many rules. We need to help novices, experts, people who build infrastructures, applications, da 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 da. There are no way you can remember all of those rules. Furthermore, um, I think I have 350 by now for this, and we're nowhere near the end. There's too many, you wouldn't even go and read them at all. And more interestingly, you do not need most of those rules. Most of you do it anyway. We don't make that mistake. We learned that 10 years ago. So that rule exists, but gee, everybody knows it. On the other hand, the rules are for people that don't know it, the novices, the people who are casual users, the people that has 15 years of experience on a different kind of code base, things like that. That's what rule for. And uh, you, you, you can't sit wasting your time programming, trying to remember the rules and looking them up. No. Furthermore, you will never get there because the rule set is extensible. As we learn, we add rules to it. So if last month you wrote something and you fulfilled all the rules, you try it again this month, we'll hope to catch you once again with some new rules um, that, that verified, principled, validated by experience, uh, will be helpful. And you know, you shouldn't know the rules. The tool knows the rules. My ideal is you run the tool and it drops you right in there showing the rule on the screen. What was the rule that was violated? Where was it violated? What's the rationale for the rule? What's the example of how bad it can get from problems like that? And here's what you should do instead. That's what I would like to see. And um, so there's too many rules and it doesn't worry me. I want lots of rules. Um, and here's uh, the set of uh, the classification. Uh, there's the philosophical rules. Basically the, the conceptual framework that cannot be validated, but it's really good if you sort of understood what, what being said there. Uh, if nothing else, you will know what we were thinking when we wrote them. 
Um, and then there's all kinds of things, interfaces, functions, classes, class hierarchies, da 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 da. Um, there's supporting sections, naming and layout, that's where everybody goes and then they say they don't like uh, the rules we wrote. That's fine, never met anybody that, that liked the whole set of rules. People say they want camel case. Sure, I hate camel case, but apart from that, was that um, C sharp camel case or Java camel case? Right, it's, that, that's just too much of it. There's rules for performance. Some people are interested in performance. There's different kinds of performance. Some of these rules you can go up and look at today, now, uh, but some of the areas are fairly weak. The guidance for the standard library is weak. The standard, the, the discussion of concurrency is fairly weak because we haven't had enough time. This was a project that, in fact, it started in sort of March, April, and, and we're shipping now. This, is, uh, this talk is trying to encourage you to help to make it a community, large community project. Uh, it's not sort of the kind of polished academic thing with, with lots of proofs and Greek letters that, that this is the right thing. No, it's, this is an attempt to do something um, um, major and something interesting. This is not unambitious. We're trying to scale to the four plus million C++ programmers and a few billion lines of code. While not uh, breaking the zero overhead principle. So the code will be better. No type uh, errors, no resource leaks, no dangling pointers, da 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 da. We go after our uh, most favorite, sorry, least favorite bugs. And uh, so basically, it's uh, full speed ahead, and we expect some rough waters, but if you're thinking of sailing ships, you can actually sail faster if there's a storm going on. So that's, that's what we're heading into. And basically, we actually aim to change the way we write code. And, and that means you. What should your code, what would you like your code to look like in five or 10 years? And really, honestly, if the answer is just like what I wrote yesterday, there's some failing of imagination here. We, we really want to make change, and that can be painful. It's not easy to modernize code. It is not easy to modernize a large code space. It is painful. But you know, if you don't do it, you'll have the same pain from your existing code that now 10 years old, in five years, and it'll be 15 years old, and it's not going to feel any better. And um, gradual adoption, of course, uh, is, is necessary for this. The, the idea of taking a uh, five million line code base and saying, okay, we'll just change this, and uh, after the weekend, we'll use the new version. Um, hmm, probably not. And, we will not all agree of what the code should look like, so there will be some, some discussions. Part of it will be that not all code should look the same. I really don't work, want to work under the constraints from my um, flight control software when I'm writing an ordinary application. It's just too painful. On the other hand, there will be discussion about what is common and what isn't. Uh, if you look at the rules, you will find that some of them are somewhat controversial. And that's fine. I just chose what I'm pretty sure is the right answer. And if you don't agree, I'm willing to argue with you. And so that's going to be fun. And basically, help wanted. Look at the rules. Help review them. Help suggest new rules. Help suggest better explanations of the rules. Um, currently, there's only two editors of this, me and Herb Sutter. Uh, that is too low a number. And so we need more editors. But You'll have to earn your right to be an editor. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's a crucial position in the uh, community. And so the current status, about 350 rules, and there's a GitHub for it. Um, we put it live, I think, Friday, and uh, we're already getting uh, pull requests. And uh, there's a the guideline support library, tested on Clang GCC Microsoft on uh, Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac. It's available now. And the first tools should come. Microsoft is shipping something, I think, next month. 
I don't know their shipping schedule, so I can't be precise. And uh, we hope ports to the other systems are uh, coming uh, right after. It's uh, written as fairly intended portable uh, C++, ISO C++, so that should work. And yeah, we need help. And this, from my perspective, means that the basic C++ model is actually complete. I was going for the idea that you could get perfect resource safety and type safety. And I've been trying to get there for many, many years. It was the ideal from day one, and I knew we couldn't get there in any time soon. I think we are there. And uh, by the way, if you look at my definition of resource safety, you'll see that it's really not very many languages that can claim that. And for static type safety, not very many pay, uh, uh, languages can claim that. No range errors and dereference errors without serious overhead. That's more languages can claim that, but it's still hard. This is this is not unambitious, as I said. And we now have concepts, so we can deal we can uh, deal with uh, templates in a more reasonable way. So, with all of these problems solved from a research point of view. Why didn't I just go back to academia and design a new language? That's, after all, what most people do, right? It's a cool thing to do. As I said earlier, competing with C++ is hard. I put these um, um, tool chains up there to show what anybody with a new language is up against. Um, competing with C++ has, over the years, not been, been a winning strategy. And um, it will take, take time. And furthermore, uh, certainly going into a new language could fracture the C++ community, which is about the last thing I want to do. So we're going for something that can work now, the uh, guidelines and tools, and uh, hope to get there. So basically, with, with that, I will switch to questions. And I left the, um, the outline of the uh, guidelines up there. Uh, by the way, the um, what's it called? The guy there is Heracles, Hercules, fighting the Hydra. Um, this is a bit like what it feels like. We have um, a many-headed monster we have to fight, and there's a nasty tendency of getting more heads as we make progress. So, thank you. Sure, there's some, is there a microphone somewhere? Uh, okay, I'm back. So the question is, why do I mark owner rather than non-owner? And yes, we discussed that. And my conjecture is that there are too many hundreds of millions of lines of code that uses T star to mean non-owner. And I really don't want people to write very many owners. I want the owners to disappear into abstractions. So as for now, there are many more non-owners than owners. In the future, I expect there to be a thousand or more than a thousand times as many non-owners and owners in code. Because pointers are now getting safer and you can use them more freely. So I think I got the, the, the owner, non-owner default correct maybe the first time in the history of uh, C++ we got a default right. But I'm pretty sure this one is right. Question here? There. Hi. So I had a question about owner T. And one thing I was confused about, it, is owner T just something that is used at compile time or does it use any sort of like runtime overhead or might it? It's, it's something that's used only at compile time and it does absolutely nothing. It is something that guides a user or a enforcement tool to see what you're supposed to do with it. In particular, if you're not an owner, you're not supposed to delete it. You're not going to pass it to an owner. If you are an owner, you have better either give it to somebody else who's also an owner, or delete it. A tool can verify that. It doesn't do anything. 
uh, you can encapsulate an owner into a, say, a unique pointer and then just use it because it does the deletes and has the right semantics. But the owner is a low-level marker to help static analysis. And I, I didn't mention it, but I should. Static analysis is local static analysis using very few rules. It's going to be fast. It's not one of these uh, n-cubed algorithms over all of your code. It, it, it's, it's local fast stuff, local rules. Quick question, what happens, if, what happens when you move from not null? What happens when I move from not null into what? But, like, in, like whether you're passing it or, or you know, you, you, you move from it and then what, what was the remaining state remains, becomes null, right? Um, if you move from a pointer, it's just a copy, so it doesn't become null. If you generalize it to, um, to smart pointers and such, it will have to have the appropriate semantics. I don't know if the implementation is there. You should ask uh, Neil McIntosh on Wednesday. Uh, he is the one that did the last version of the implementation, which I haven't read yet. He made some improvements uh, last week. Uh, but basically, no, you cannot violate not null that easily. Uh, question down there somewhere? Yeah, I'm just intrigued by the uh, supporting section N, the non-rules. Yes. Um, one thing that we found was that there are popular common wisdom that happens to be false. And so we had to, we found that rather than finding a lot of rules and then people could deduce that their um, common knowledge, their myths were, were violated, we better be explicit about it. So the, we, it's just some rules that, uh, that says, no, we're not doing this, no, we're not doing that, so that you can see it. We want things to be clear and upfront. Um, I'm, I'm getting a bit numbskull, otherwise I could, um, could have come with a good example. Oh yeah, one of them like, use shared pointer everywhere. Um, yes, if you have infinite time and if you want to risk um, things like circles and such uh, like that, yeah, but we, we want to say that's not what we're doing. And so rather than scattering that knowledge all over the, um, the rules, which are basically a knowledge base, right? Uh, it is called out. This is not what we're doing. A question here? Um, so one of the things that I have the unfortunate pleasure of dealing with is, is C APIs that take your things like your least favorite pointer and length pair and, and things like that. Are there plans to have guidelines for how to deal with those interfaces and make them safer in C++? I have no plans uh, of, of dealing with, with, with foreign systems. It, that will not be in the uh, core guidelines. But I wouldn't be at all surprised, and I'll be very happy if somebody would write a section that says, how do you interact with, um, with slash CLI? How do you interact with Java? How do you interact with Python? I really hope to see somebody write those sections. Uh, quite likely, they will be of the form that you can do this static analysis to make it simpler. You can have this tiny, tiny little set of classes for uh, doing the transmission. Uh, here's an analysis of the cost of uh, using, say, the Java native interface or something. But these will be special extensions that, that you can use. And we are providing a strategy and a format and encouraging help. I mean, the example you picked in particular, I would not be qualified for doing. So we, we need more expertise. Uh, Question here. Yeah. How is the JSL work related with the concepts? Sorry, I didn't hear a word of that. How the JSL work is related to concepts? How is JSL related to concepts? 
the GSL has a section um, dealing with concepts. It lists about 20 concepts, uh, most of them from, um, from uh, Andrew Sutton's uh, origin implementation of concepts, uh, his li standard library version, and a few from the um, Eric Niebler's uh, range proposal. Um, and there are rules that basically says use concepts. And so when you write a um, template, the rule says you should just use concepts. Now, of course, you can't because the overwhelming likelihood is that your compiler doesn't have it yet. On the other hand, we're planning for the future. My hope is that next year all the compilers will have concepts. And so my idea is that you actually write currently with requires and the concepts. There's a set of concepts we recommend, but you can have your own if you like. And then you put slash slash in front of it. And next year, when your compiler gets updated, take away the slashes. So you will get your design in place. You will have to think about concepts, um, but you can't actually enforce it till next year. I, especially, I think, especially when we come to concurrency, there will be several other rules that you can't actually follow till the, um, till, till, till the standard catches up with where we think the standard should be. Uh, yes. Uh, how, how would you compare the uh, guidelines described in the book C++ coding standards? And uh, is the uh, C++ core guidelines supposed to supersede that book or be complementary to it? Yeah, I, I didn't quite hear all of it, but um, you're asking how it relates to Herb and Andre's uh, book on coding standards. Now, um, let's see. Uh, Herb and I had some discussion about this. And, and my comment to Herb was, this is great stuff, but mostly it's meta rules. That is, it's, 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 it's fairly high level and philosophical in the book, and it's meant to be read. These are guidelines. Uh, most of it, 95% and rising, are concrete, simple rules in context. And a book like the um, C++ coding uh, rules um, are good to read. It's roughly philosophically in agreement with the rules here, but the rules are much sharper, much more detailed. And I would say you can see that it's a different decade. Uh, things have been modernized, and Herb wants to say something about that. I'll, I'll just say you'll see some of that text already in Appendix C. We actually started from there and then decided to reboot it along the lines that Bjarne said, but we've got some text from C++ coding standards, and you'll likely see some more. Yeah, so uh, it, it looked more like the coding guidelines to begin with, and then it looks actually more like those little advice sections at the end of my books. And if you look at the format, it looks more like the JSF++ uh, rules, which was the last rule set I did. But uh, this has a lot to do with making things practical, actionable, um, sup tool supported. Question here. Uh, I was just wondering how it's possible to achieve uh, type safety and memory safety, um, avoiding all the complexity that Russ brought to the table when just with a library solution. Uh, could you say the last bit of, again? Um, avoiding the complexity that Rust brought to the table and um, only with a yes, library solution. Yes, how do, we, uh, how do we get the type and resource safety without going into the Rust complexities? Um, basically by relying more on static analysis, basically by wanting to stay very close to existing good C++ that could do it, rather than providing language features that people uh, should use. Uh, people have again and again tried for those aims by creating a new language with facilities for exactly saying things. Cyclone was an uh, early example of that. And they tend to accrete complexity as they, uh, they, they try to get more general. And so we go the other way. We, we, we have C++ with all its generality and the messes and then we try to stick to the working subset. Um, from a philosophical point, it's quite difficult. Um, the aims are the same. Uh, Rust has the advantage of not having 30 years of um, background and uh, 
a few billion lines of code to deal with, but C++ has some experience and uh, user community. So if we went this way, um, putting in lots of language features, I think, would be the wrong answer in the context of C++. How does the static analysis work with uh, async code? Works with what? Async code, like callbacks. Um, it does. Uh, I, I can't go into to detail here. Again, uh, go, go to uh, Neil McIntosh's talk. Um, at some point, we depart from the, the symbol, um, I think I have three rules for ownership and three rules to avoid dangling pointers, um, plus a force for concurrency. And then we have to go into the details of we are looking at this function, and we, we have to do an analysis. And that basically becomes uh, roughly a symbolic execution that takes care of ownership and dangliness, whatever you call that property. And each function is done, and you can record what, um, what it was, what, 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 how it was related to that. And so when you call a function, like in a callback, you know what the called function do. And that the work, the backbreaking work that has been done in that area is going through all the combinations of control structures and uh, uh, kinds of pointers, pointers, references, da 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 da, and, and make sure that you've covered all the cases. I think um, we can guarantee you some bugs in the early versions. It, we try very hard not to have them, but you know, it is complexity there. Um, I think from a fundamental point of view, if we're dealing with a toy language, we would be there. Hi, um, uh, I work on uh, computational physics, so I found it very interesting that you had uh, somebody from CERN uh, also involved with this effort. And so my question is that uh, of all these guidelines and, you know, uh, um, uh, pieces of advice, is there something particular which applies to scientific computing at CERN and other places? Um, one of the things we have been doing is to try and branch out. Um, you saw the, the, the three organization mentioned was, a, let's call it an infrastructure uh, company, a financial company, and a scientific computation company. And I actually spent the previous week uh, at a CERN workshop about the future of uh, scientific computation at CERN. Um, also, some of the people that are listed in the acknowledgments, but not with organizations, a friend of mine working in the uh, embedded systems industry. We need to get a very broad view of it. And then we find what it, we consider the core and then we have extensions. I'm sure we'll see extensions for hard real time, for kernel work, for scientific work, for low latency work, things like that. It's, but but, but the, 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 we, we want breadth. We want input from many, many um, industries. And we want to have as much as we can in the core, but not everything can be in the core. And so the other areas will be covered. Um, I must say I spent most of my time roughly on I.O. and storage and uh, concurrency, so the actual computation part we never got to. Uh, somebody will get there. There is a section called arithmetic, which is basically empty. Uh, we, we know we have to get there. A question here? So my question is uh, related where, where? over here. There. <laughs> to, uh, uh, compile time checking of thread safety, and it builds upon Herb Sutter's talk from a couple of years ago about using mutable and const to actually enforce compile time thread safety guarantees on const correctness. Yes. The place where we found this really fell down, though, was with smart pointers and things like owned pointers, because you can always basically throw away constants by a pointer dereference. So, 
we went and actually made our own smart, smart pointer classes that actually enforced this, but was this a good idea? Was this a bad idea? Do we need guidelines on basically ensuring thread safety? Uh, I, I, I could not hear the middle part oh. of your talk, let, of your question. <laughs> let me try and answer it and then hold on to the phone, sure. uh, to the microphone, so that for the, for the bit I miss. We have a concurrency section. I mentioned it's one of the weakest ones, and uh, it, it has, I don't know, 20 rules, that kind of order, but they're not specific enough. And we, we need more, and we need help from the community. I specifically called that out. Um, there are problems with interaction with, uh, with smart pointers, but um, roughly, we can use a shared pointer to keep things alive if you have things like detached threads. Um, and we can also use uh, scoped uh, uh, tasks so that they won't join. Uh, the things will not go invalid until they join. Um, so I expect that in that area there will be some fairly simple rules. And when in you, if you have kept your thread alive with a shared pointer, or if you have scoped it, pointers will actually work. Um, we also need to use some of the sort of research techniques for statically detecting deadlocks. We don't have any rules about that, but we know the research, and we're pretty sure we can um, get deadlock avoidance uh, rules into this, but we need help. If you relied on me, it will take roughly forever. I've got too much on my plate, so uh, I encourage people to, to volunteer. That's one of the areas we know we have to go. Did I answer the whole question? Um, it was more Kant's correctness of smart pointers themselves, basically. Why does a smart pointer dereference remove Kant's? Was that a, a, a specific I don't know, decision? I, I don't think I should answer it okay. right here. It's, uh, now we get into to, to, too great detail. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, um, with the not null type, why not just suggest to use a reference instead, since that's also uh, a pointer that's Because when null. you are doing things like uh, object-oriented programming, uh, you want to rebind. And so if you have a pointer that can point to something and then change the point to something else, it can't be a reference. Now, I want smart references. I have a proposal in the uh, standard process, in which case you could get it, but it still wouldn't be references. It would be smart references. Uh, but that's a fundamental reason. Also, one of the fundamental reasons that you need references and pointers, as opposed to just plain scoped objects, uh, is, is basically object-oriented programming where you point to a, an interface and you don't know all the, the rest about what there is. So, we, yes, we need pointers. References are not enough. Question over here. Um, one of the things Rust did was uh, it introduced ownership into the type system that's checked at compile time. Mm -hmm. um, my question was, do you see uh, some of these guidelines or things like the ownership being something like a flag you turn on in your compiler when you compile your, your code that it's checked then and there versus something that is just, you know, you run your compiler and then you run an additional tool to check it later? I think for all of the sort of easily actionable kind of rules, I would expect and hope that compiler writers would get into the act. Um, I especially appeal to the compiler writers for, for Clang. I know some of them are in the room. I hope there are some of the, my friends from GCC here. Um, I would like them to help too. And it is in design group. I, I showed the strength of uh, C++ by naming something. And I would really like if some of these people would help but we have to be careful. We have to make sure that we, uh, we don't start creating a dialect language. We have to be sure we don't get a lot of uh, false positives. But yes, some of the rules are, in my opinion, and at my experience here, not having done it, uh, something that a compiler could do without slowing down compilations. I really want fast compilations. Go to Gabby's talk about modules. 
so we, we, we don't want C++ to start running as slow as certain languages I should not name. Um, after all, they do the favor of making C++ compilations look fast. Um, A question here? Yeah. Uh, yes, oh, I just was there and then there. Sorry. Uh, yes, I just was wondering if there is a proposal to create uh, similar standard guidelines for other languages like Java, C Sharp, uh, Python, etc. I I I hear that our guidelines uh, trended sort of like number one on GitHub uh, over the weekend. Uh, and I hear that there suddenly was a surge of guidelines for other languages when people thought it was a good idea. But to be honest, I don't care much. Those are their problems. I will deal with the problems I can deal with. Uh, the other communities will undoubtedly do their best. And if we come up with something that's pioneering, they will borrow it and forgot to acknowledge us. But uh, I'm, I'm focused on C++. And uh, as this guy said, obviously we need guidelines for interacting with other languages. Um, this guy here who has been very polite. Thank you. So I have a question. So to my understanding, the GSL offers owner, which can help us with things like pointers and problems like delete, for example, yes. right? I'm wondering, is there some comparable static analysis a helper object for std thread and things like joinability or, or paths or detaching? Currently, there are, as I said, not much support for concurrency, but we think it is possible. We think it's doable, and we are appealing for help in those areas. But it seems to be a similar problem, right? Then you also could yes. scope this to the yes, root yes, of Yes, the, yes, 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 I, I agree. Um, but, you know, I could have waited a year or two years and then tell you about it. I thought it was a much better thing to say, look, we have what we think is a good idea. We have a start. Let's see where we can go with this. What do you see as the uh, future role of analysis tools like Coverity, for example, as the GSL gains more traction? I hope for many tools. And I hope that I have consistently used the plural when I have mentioned tools and, and been specific saying our tool when we worked with what there is just now. And um, Coverity has made a very valuable contribution and has been able to do things because of their expertise and because of their scale and because of their revenue streams that other people haven't been able to do. And my view is that there's a place for open source stuff like we will be producing, and there will probably be a significant uh, business in making things that are better than the default that you can get in the environment, going into greater detail, uh, going into uh, better integration, going into more specific systems. Uh, basically, not that different from what we see today. There's an open source world and there's a, um, there, there, there's, there's a for-profit world. And both needs each other because if the community is so totally unaware of the tools and techniques that is used in the advanced systems. It's really hard to have an advanced business because you have to convince people they need it. So I, I hope there will be uh, a space for, for, for both. Hi, um, quick question. Um, you mentioned smart references. Does that mean that you'll be overloading the dot operator? I would very much like to overload the dot operator. Uh, look into the papers for WG21 and you'll find a paper by me saying how I think we should do it. We should have smart references just so like we have smart pointers because people are using the smart pointers to do things that really are references and that's weird. Um, I don't see anything on here about portability. Do you think that would be a useful um, 
thing to have a set of guidelines about? Um, I, there's two answers to this. Um, the first one is that we are sticking to um, ISO standard C++. And so you get the first level of portability there. We're not using extensions. For portability in things like checking the sizes of integers and that kind of stuff, uh, it seems a good idea. Uh, I have not thought much about it. And I have actually been very worried about that particular aspect because there's guidelines that says, don't do this because, say, Microsoft Release 5 can't handle it. That was 20 years ago. And I really, really want to have the rules forward looking. And by doing that, I will limit portability. I say, OK, the current rules really like a C++ 11 compiler. If you are on GCC uh, 3.8, tough. Update. It's good for you anyway. And uh, so I will not, uh, I will not, if, if somebody wants to have that kind of rules, I think they will find that backward looking portability rules will disable most of the um, guidelines. They're forward looking. So that's why I haven't gone there. Question here. Hi, uh, I'd like us, why a separate library, why not make it part of the standard library? Why is the what? Why a separate library, why not make it part of the standard library? I don't hear the last bit. Why not part of the standard library? Uh, because it takes years to get things into the standard library. I emphasize I want it now. I mean, I was starting in March, April, and I was very impatient. I have this wonderful language, and people can't write it. Um, it's, it's, I want something now. And you know, I didn't get it now, but you know, I think I'm going to start at an industrial scale next month. And um, doing anything in a community as large as C++ in, in half a year is interesting. The standard, yeah, we'll go to the standard and say, look, you have already got halfway there. How about, here's, we've got some experience for you. A ray view is in the process. Uh, we're using the standard uh, libraries, uh, shared pointer, unique pointer, vector, um, but concepts we're getting next year, but the particular concept hasn't been standardized, but we borrowed it from proposals that are in the process. So we're very much keen on being part of that process. And uh, I just didn't want to wait two years or three years. 17 is coming, but it's not there yet. So uh, I'm a C++ developer, and I'm also a C++ teacher. Uh, how do you see this kind of guidelines and rules and the ways they are presented uh, help C++ to be more easy uh, teachable to, uh, let's say, student or newcomers to the language? I, I really would like if some teachers would say, let's try and teach uh, the guidelines C++. That is, write a course where you start from day one with uh, the full analysis in, so that we could get a generation of C++ programmers that, that, that basically never had to be paranoid because of dangling pointers. And uh, things like that. So I hope it comes into the teaching um, community. I think it will probably first come into the trainers, the commercial teachers, and then hopefully eventually um, into the academic world. I mean, if I had infinite time, I would rewrite um, one of my simpler books to do it. But I don't have infinite time. As a matter of fact, I don't have very much time. So I don't think you should expect me to lead that charge. But let's get it into education. We can do much, much better. There's a lot of false myth about C++, and we are demonstrating them to be false with this. Question here? Yeah. So we've, we have a lot of legacy code at our, uh, at our company, and I'm constantly seeing people writing find if, rewriting remove if, rewriting reverse. 
I was hoping if, I was wondering if GSL could help us find algorithms that already exist that are being written manually, and if not, uh, if, there, if you know of anything that can. Yeah, again, there's a couple of uh, answers to that one. Uh, the first one is that having a few million lines of such code is one of the reasons I'm so impatient and that we are doing this. And one of the reasons that, say, Microsoft and uh, CERN is, are also involved is they have exactly the same problem. I think just about any C++ shop that has been successful since the 90s or the noughts uh, will have this problem. And there is an almost empty section on how to modernize code, which, which basically boils down to uh, be careful, use as many rules as you can, uh, be aggressive introducing new rules, and uh, hope somebody will build us some uh, uh, tools to help us modernize code. And I know people are already doing it. I hope that we can encourage them to do it further and that the tools for transformation and analysis of old code uh, will take the rules into account. And that people do that will feed into the rules. We want some feedback loops here. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that thank you for making this a separate small library apart from any other project because getting this through security review is going to be quick and painless. I think uh, so, <laughs> yes. I have already heard it. Since it was released on Friday, I have heard of one case of people who's already done that. But um, remember, um, I work for a bank, and I am very aware of that problem. We really want it to be straightforward to, to use. Uh, furthermore, I, I really think that some of the libraries are wonderful. There's lots and lots of stuff in them. But you know, there's lots and lots of stuff in it, and we don't use everything. My guess is that if you start using the rules, you will very soon be, be using almost all of the GSL. But the cheat sheet is on, the, uh, is on one sheet of paper and the implementation is, is very small. As I said, Neil um, McIntosh will explain it all on, uh, on Wednesday. And one thing I should mention, by the way, for the analysis part, the static analysis part, um, there's Neil McIntosh and there's also Herb Sutter's talk tomorrow that will go into that. Uh, I have one question. Um, had you plans, or do you think about using annotations to give the meta information to the static analysis? Because I, I think it, could, it would be great to distinguish um, the meta information from the real code. Let's see. Um, yeah. Are you suggesting that you should annotate the source language to get the checking? Yes, no? Yes, okay. We, we considered that. And I have observed that most programmers hate writing things. And they especially hate writing things that they think that the compiler should be able to figure out. And so we fairly deliberately try to minimize what you have to write to get the services. Owner but you will not have to write it unless you're writing abstractions or you have messy ABI problems. Uh, not null, because I couldn't see a way of, of not annotating it. Uh, array view, because you, you, you need to get that information explicit that the count really is the count. And that's about it. Um, there will probably be ways of opting out of checking. But I think by default, things should work, as opposed to requiring people to, to annotate everything. It's the same as uh, Peter's comment, why is it owner rather than not owner? Because there's a thousand times more non-owners than owners. Let, let, let's try and get the notational overhead low. Yeah. Hi. Um, you have a slide uh, listing the sorts of involvement that you would like from the I'm community. I'm having trouble hearing you. You have a uh, slide listing the sorts of involvement that you'd like from the community. 
Um, I was wondering how you foresee the process of evolving not just the library, but the rules themselves over time? Um, the way I um, imagine that is that we have some GitHubs, and uh, for the GitHubs, uh, we have to have somebody that approves it. Uh, I mean, every successful open source project has editors or maintainers or benevolent dictators or whatever you call it. We, we don't want all the rules there is, but we don't want a lot of input. So currently, we have two editors, me and Herb Sutter, and I specifically mentioned we need more. Um, even a mailing list needs uh, some kind of approvers and such. So um, there, there will be a filter, and um, the filter exists, um, and it will evolve. Uh, hopefully, we can set a good example on um, both approving things reasonably promptly, improving things based on input, and rejecting things that doesn't fit with the overall philosophy, and articulating the overall philosophy. And I think Herb wants to say something. It's on GitHub. Open issues, to participate in the discussion there. People have already been having, uh, doing that over the weekend, and it's a, going to be a popular indoor sport this winter. No question here. Hi, quick question. You mentioned briefly um, static type analysis and being a requirement. I was wondering if you could speak briefly on the future of type inference and its role in that in C++ going Try forward. again. Try again. I didn't get it. Curious if your thoughts on type inference, like auto for static type okay. safety uh, for C++ now that's a, that's a language issue. Um, now, there are things where we put assumptions in place, like a pointer points to one element and is not an owner. And so we, we, we infer things from that. But I um, mean, C++ has relied on, on some forms of type inference from templates, which are Turing complete and does uh, uh, infer a lot. And also, of course, just take the uh, type from the, um, from the initializer. But we're not touching the core language. Um, for, for this guideline stuff, um, Questions about how the language should evolve are almost out of, um, out of bounds. But I'm trying, but don't, don't expect to see any, any dramatic exchange, uh, uh, increases in uh, type deduction in the language. And certainly not within the time frame of what we're talking about here. Oh, and by the way, I hope this stiff stuff goes on forever because I am worried about the coding guidelines that get put in place, get published, and are used 20 years later. We mustn't become a burden to the community. While um, GSL looks like it addresses some of the technical uh, tool support for um, coding guidelines, um, do you anticipate in five years we're still having the same philosophical debate about um, autocratic coding styles and how do you use the GSL? Um, yes, we will. Uh, I mean, people like to discuss things, and uh, we will be discussing it. We'll be discussing which rules are good, which rules are bad, um, et cetera, et cetera. That's life. It'll go on forever. But I think we're making progress. I mean, the, if you look at the C++ community and the, the best C++ code, roughly every year in the last 30-some has seen improvements and I want to accelerate that improvement, I don't expect to reach perfection. So to that, and do you have a process of deprecating rules? Um, the standard now has a deprecate uh, annotation you can put on it. Um, for rules, yeah, sooner or later we will have to retire some and change some because we will get experience and we will find that some rules are contradictory. In a rule set this large, there will be mutual contradiction, and we won't find them till a bit later. Uh, exactly how we'll handle retirement, deprecation, change, I don't know. Uh, we have to learn. Yeah, one last question. 
Um, so you had mentioned the uh, being forward-looking, and uh, I know there are a lot of new things coming in 17. Are any of these rules, uh, or can you, can you give examples of any rules that um, anticipate 17 features, like do this because concepts is coming, do this because modules yeah. is coming? We have, we have rules that uh, presupposes concepts. That, that's one example. Uh, we have all the rules that says array uh, um, what is that? array uh, view, which anticipates a version of, of the array view proposal passing. So yeah, we, we, we're looking ahead. I expect, as I said, that once we get into more details with the concurrency rules, we will be anticipating even more. Um, and you know, if we anticipate wrongly, maybe we learn something, both for the rules and for the standards process. I, I really hope that this and the standards process uh, will coexist uh, to the mutual benefit. May, may, uh, it's gone. I'm getting the, it's all over. I'll be around for the rest of the week, but thank you for now.